fuck? So, after defeating Asgore and having him killed by Flowey, we open the game to... a void? Just a lone save point and... How is this the same game? How is this the same Undertale that brought me Temmies and the annoying dog and dating a fucking skeleton? How? And now we're trapped in some nightmare void with a sentient flower that's become some... some sort of god of space and time, but... But fuck it! And fuck that flower, it's still a flower! Maybe some treading or a few sprays of Roundup should sort this little prick out. Grotesque! That's all this thing is, just completely grotesque. With the power of six human souls, Flowey has become this abomination. And with it, the game takes a strange turn with the combat. Now it's more of a bullet hell than an RPG. When we fight back, it barely phases Flowey, and the attacks we have to dodge are, for the lack of a better term, unreasonable. Just like Asgore, it seems, it's a matter of survival, but this time it's hopeless. After a certain time, one of the souls is used to attack us, bringing a new type of move into the combat. And during this time, we can call for help. For this vain attempt, we are healed, ready for the next onslaught. The souls fighting back, coming to our aid as it's simply an issue of staying alive. Each soul has its own stage, from words flying out of a book or a frying pan raining us with flames, as if each human soul has its own personality. And after all six get their time, they emerge from Flowey, and heal us once more, and drop Flowey's defence to zero. And now the matter of survival turns into a fight for our life. After Asgore, no one could have expected this. No one. Flowey's intentions of kill or be killed at the start of the game are shady at best, but I simply assumed he was more of a tutorial piece, not a major part of the plot. The true horror of his form, the grinding of the music, the helpless feeling of getting hit by bloody everything. And then Undertale gives us one of its greatest gifts. Finale. The piece that plays when Flowey finally becomes vulnerable. Many reviews tell of Undertale's exceptionally scripted story, or its simplistic and yet inspired take on the regular RPG design formula. But all critics and fans agree that Toby Fox, creator of Undertale, outdid himself with the most incredible soundtrack. Finale is one of the ending tunes from the game, a fast-paced, percussion-pounding piece reflecting the part of the game all too well. Not a grinding snarl that was Flowey's fight music, the piece incorporates the chimey bit tune of Undertale's main light motif, driven into a chaotic uproar of sound. It's a track of new hope, a melody that spurs to a fighting chance, a final push to freedom.
At the end of it all, after we pass through the barrier, the game leaves us with a phone call from all those we left behind in the underground. Of all those we didn't get to save. Sans, Papyrus, Undyne, letting us know they're okay and, although we're gone, they still have hope that they will escape one day. Without our help, they'll find a way to join us. And you know what? It's bullshit. It's utter bullshit. What's bullshit? Oh, where the fuck were you? Around. What's up? Well, I finished your game. How's this supposed to renew my faith, huh? How is this supposed to fill me with holiday cheer? Ah, I see. You didn't get the good ending, did you? Good ending? I did everything right. I dated a skeleton. I helped a kid off a ledge. I fucking cooked spaghetti with a fish lady. What else do I need to do? Stuff. You know, okay. Look. Let me use some of my Christmas magic to fix everything, okay? Uh, nothing's happened. Hmm. It's a little bit strange. Usually resets everything when I do that. Well, I guess we have to do this the old-fashioned way. <sighs> the old-fashioned way? What are, you, what are you talking about, the old-fashioned way? What do you mean? What are you doing? What? No! Sleep. Oh, child. Sleep. Go to sleep. It's bedtime now. Yes. Sleepy time. It's okay. I know a shortcut. What? What happened? I fixed the game for you. Oh, Jesus, what are you doing? Sometimes, I just like to lie on the floor, you know? Like garbage. Gives you some perspective on life. Oh, God, you're the worst Santa ever. Oh, calm down, man. I got you where you needed to be. You can take it from here. Uh. As it turns out that once the neutral route has been completed at least once, even if you reload the save, returning to the bridge from MTT Resort to the core will trigger Undyne calling you about delivering a letter. You know, a few moments away from fighting the king of all monsters and Undyne wants a postman, but uh, why not? Taking a letter from her in Snowden to the lab in Hotland, we slide it under the door for Dr. Alphys, who reads the note and... wants to go on a date. Oh no. No, 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 no. I'm fine with Papyrus, at least he's funny. I don't want to date this sad sack nerd. No, thank you. Oh, God. Oh, God, no. Stop! As unappealing as Alphys is, we finally hear the truth about her strange obsession with Undyne. She loves her. I mean, I think so, anyway. I personally don't know what love is, but I sure as hell don't want two lesbian scaly things to show me. But Alphys comments on more serious issues she has, a lack of self-confidence and a feeling of worthlessness. Now there are parallels to be shown here, especially when Undyne overhears the conversation. From long range! Undyne starts by admitting that although she approves of Alphys's nerdy hobbies like watching anime, she doesn't care about those things. She cares about her analytical mind and her dedication to whatever she sets out on. It's a great little piece that shows you that, no matter what you think of yourself, someone will find something good within you, something to love. And in a time where many young people are mired with feelings of denigration and aspire to media-flaunted ideals of unobtainable beauty and body size, it goes to show that it's a shallow need compared to what it means to actually be someone rather than look like something. 
beauty is on the inside and all that. And besides all that mushy stuff, this scene also gives us papyrus in running gear. I fucking love you, papyrus! I fucking love you! With the, uh, the date over, Papyrus calls us and tells us to visit Alphys, which we do. It leads us to her empty lab and a note on the floor, with her bathroom door wide open. Here, we descend into the true lab. This is where the game takes a surprising horror turn. Things are dark and grimly, the whole place looks forgotten and abandoned. The soundtrack is grating and industrial rather moody with a very minor piano tune playing throughout. Within the True Lab, monitors give us journal entries into Alphys' research, the nature of souls. Asgore, in a desperate bid to free his people, asked her as rural scientists to help the monsters escape the underground. With the human souls Asgore had already... collected, she found out of a power that allows humans greater strength and allows their souls to persist after death. She coined this power, Determination. An ability to fight an endeavour beyond all limitations that monsters had. Extracted from the human souls, she injected this power into monsters that had fallen and were comatose. And within the lab, we find the results of this research. The amalgamates. Monsters are not as physical as humans, most of their form made of magic, which is unable to sustain the determination of a human soul. Their bodies began to twist and melt together, becoming monstrosities of their former selves, freakish giants of different parts. In fact, many of them share acts and features from monsters we've already seen before. Alphys hid away her mistakes, ignoring the pleas of the families wishing to recover what they assumed were the remains of their passed away loved ones. For fear of what people might say, she kept it all a secret. Our purpose within the True Lab is to find power switches and keys to activate them, to restart the power and work the elevator to escape. And then, we find a room with a VHS player and tapes. Here documents the life of the Prince, the King's son, Asriel. We hear of Toriel's excitement of being a mother, of Asriel playing with a childhood friend with the same name as ours. Well, I mean, the same name that I used at the start. What? How does that make sense? On the tapes, they keep mentioning the name I picked. Have we been in the underground before? As we restart the power, we're confronted by Alphys' creations. She calls them off and tells us that she will return them to their families and that she has the confidence to face what she's done because her friends are there for her. Yet as we leave, two missing entries power up on the wall. I've chosen a candidate. I haven't told Asgore yet because I want to surprise him with it. In the center of his garden, there's something special. The first golden flower that grew before all the others. The flower from the outside world. I wonder, what happens when something without a soul gains the will to live? The flower's gone. Indy, are you there? It's been a long time, hasn't it? But you've done well. Thanks to you, everything has fallen into place. Indy, see you soon. Before meeting Asgore once again, we come to a long corridor draped in twilight and adorned with marble and gold. It definitely has an end feel to it, and it's here we meet a person veiled in shadow, who tells us of things we heard from Flowey at the start of the game, EXP and LV. In most other RPGs, these relate to experience points which are gained from combat and contribute to your LV or your level. With your level comes stats such as health, attack, defense, etc but not in Undertale. Your EXP stands for Execution Points, a way of quantifying the pain you have inflicted on others. With kills comes EXP, just like a normal RPG. LV, or Love, stands for Level of Violence, a way of measuring someone's capacity to hurt. 
It's a matter of vicariousness, the kill or be killed mentality of turning people into targets and ending them without remorse. You gain levels with the more violence you inflict, the more people you kill and the more you distance yourself from others. Again, just like a normal RPG. In this very setting, Toby lays out his interpretation of RPGs and shows us another side to them. His point is that, in a game world, why should killing be a part of the norm? Why should there be lives lost and characters killed? It's moving stuff. And it's all the more rewarding when we hear the character, who reveals himself to be Sans, tell us that we gained no XP and no LV. We didn't gain love, but we gained love in his words. Only now do we see Sans more than just a comic relief or some cheap joke provider. He is a judge, something more than what he shows. But for now, it's on to Asgore. Again. I've done my best. I've solved the true lab, I've spared every monster, I cooked with Undyne, I've dated a skeleton. Yes, I will keep mentioning that. I've dated a fucking skeleton. After all this, after another playthrough, I don't have it in me to fight Asgore again. <laughs> What? Goat mum? Goat mum saves the day. Is it worth killing Asgore to leave? Will that really mend everything? With this kill or be killed philosophy we're drawn into, I'm glad Toriel shows up to put a halt to the fight. It's not worth it. There must be some other way. Soon enough, the others turn up too, and it's a heartfelt reunion. Sans and Toriel meet for the first time, Undyne and Alphys almost kiss, Papyrus is just cute as shit like he always is. Nothing can ruin this. This is all your fault! I knew it! I fucking knew it! Flower, we planned this. All the friendships we made, all the people we saved. They all turn up to help me in the end, which is exactly what he wanted. And with the power of the six souls, he's strong enough to absorb the souls of every other monster in the underground and... And fuck him! I've played this game twice, I've fought through every boss monster and... And I dated a skeleton. <laughs> yeah, bring it on, you photosynthesis using, pollen spreading, bee loving piece of shit! Finally, I was so tired of being a flower. Howdy! Indy, are you there? It's me, your best friend. Asriel Dreamer! For me, Undertale is brilliant enough throughout. But this final fight is just the pinnacle of everything we've been through. There's very little that genuinely makes me tear up in video games, save for The Last of Us and parts of Heavy Rain, but this theme, the main ending tracks for the major boss battles in the game, one of those being the finale theme which I've already mentioned, are exceptional. And this fight theme, Hopes and Dreams, is the best of the lot. It's a hopeful, whimsical, almost dream-like melody woven seamlessly into a growling-paced, rock-filled cacophony. It's an anthem, a final fight with an unbeatable foe, but it's filled with determination and perseverance. It's for our friends and for the world. The second part of the song, the reprise, is called Save the World. It's filled with familiar light motifs of Asriel's childish chiming tune, with the melody based upon the opening theme, Once Upon a Time. Hopes and Dreams, I'm not ashamed to say, is a song that spurs me to sentimentality I've not had for any game since, and any game before. It is the melodic set piece that Asriel's final fight needs. 
The attacks we must deal with throughout the fight are all cosmic and dramatic, stars raining down from the sky, huge laser beams and sword swipes, all the while we can only hope of peace and dream of seeing our friends again. It's powerful, it's emotive, raw and inspiring. And soon enough, Azrael takes his final form, just as the prophecy has said. The angel, the one who has seen the surface, they will return, and the underground will go empty. And it is empty. Azrael has killed them all, taken the souls of every monster. He returned from the surface, killed by the humans who thought he had killed his best friend, his only friend, crumbled to dust as he walked into the garden of his parents, the garden where his dust lay to the flowers, and one flower that Alphys injected with determination, a flower with the will to live, but without a soul. Flowey, as Asriel Dreamer once more. An epic journey. But we're the only ones standing in his way. We can't move, we can't fight back, and soon enough, this angel, this prophetic being who has cleared the underground and wants control of the timeline, finishes us off. But it refused to die. It refused to give up. We can't escape. We can't save ourselves. But we can save something else. Here, Azrael stands at the peak of his power, at the edge of victory, while we save the souls within him. The souls of our friends, lost in the great power that is the Prince. Each one must be acted upon, to remind them of who they are. Toriel and Asgore, Papyrus and Sans, Undyne and then Alphys. We act to remind them of who they are. They are lost. Lost in selfish needs, lost in their hatred of humanity, lost in their sense of duty or their diffidence. And one by one, we save them. As we have saved them before, until only one person remains. One soul left to save. What did you do? What's this feeling? What's happening to me? No! No! I don't need anyone! S Stop it! Get away from me! Do you hear me? I'll tear you apart! Indy. Do you know why I'm doing this? Why I keep fighting to keep you around? I'm doing this because you're special, Indy. You're the only one that understands me. You're the only one who's any fun to play with anymore. I'm not ready to let this end. I'm not ready for you to leave. I'm not ready to say goodbye to someone like you again. So, please, stop doing this, and just let me win! Stop it! Stop it now! Indy... I'm so alone, Indy. I'm so afraid. <laughs> I, I. And that's it. Azrael surrenders himself to his compassion. He tells us that we're not Indy, and our character informs him that they're called Frisk. So the name we picked at the very start of the game, the name for the fallen child, which we assumed this was, was for Azrael's friend, not for our character. 
With the power of the souls, Azrael breaks the barrier and returns all the souls to the monsters, leaving him unable to remain as he is. Without the power of a soul, he will soon revert back to his old form, to Flowey. As we comfort him, he confesses that Indy wasn't a very nice person. And with that, he leaves. We awake, surrounded by our friends, all of whom have no memory of what just happened. The barrier is finally broken and the monsters are free, which gives us time to visit the people of the underground one last time before we leave. I love Undertale. That should be patently clear by now. It's an emotive powerhouse of comedy, tragedy, and ultimately joyous affability. And it's not just me. Undertale has a master fanbase that is as passionate and as creative as any, with musical covers, art, and reviews aplenty. Many would argue that the heel of Undertale is that its fans are so passionate that they seem to spoil any playthrough people make, demanding them to go a certain route or to do things in a certain order, especially when people stream the game, but because they want the person playing to experience what they experienced. But isn't that a testament of how moving this game can be? Sure, for those of you solemnly interested in gunning down people online or getting a high score on a rhythm game, Undertale won't hold your interest, but those of us looking to lose ourselves in rich and poignant worlds of deranged characters, powerful enemies and overarching lore, Undertale does all that so well. The moment when you solve the piano puzzle by offering a statue your umbrella and then having the mystical moment destroyed by the annoying dog stealing the artifact found inside the room you opened. The time when you discover Temi Village and get to talk to all the stupidly adorable characters and pay for the shopkeeper's college. The part where Sans invites you to dinner and tells you about finding the door to the ruins, joking through it with Toriel even though they don't know each other and divulging that she asked to keep any human that walks through it safe. Not to mention the amount of secret dialogue options to be found and little side plots to explore while you'll make your way through the underground. It's evident that Toby Fox channeled Earthbound when he made Undertale, considering he had made Earthbound ROM hacks in the past. But I'm sorry to any loyalist out there that might see this as a sort of blasphemy, but in my honest opinion, I believe he surpassed Earthbound. Undertale is an experience like no other. If you spend your last moments in game tracking back to the ruins, You'll find Azriel tending to the garden, tending to the spot where you and all the other humans fell, tending to the spot where he first met Indy, tending to the spot where we think Indy is buried, where his body lay after Toriel carried him from the new home when she left Asgore as he declared war on humanity. And he asks, Frisk, why did you come here? Everyone knows the legend, right? Travelers who climb Mount Ebbet are said to disappear. Frisk, why would you ever climb a mountain like that? Why would you climb Mount Abot? The mountain where people go to disappear. Indy climbed it because of his hatred of humanity. When Azriel and Indy fused, it was Indy who controlled their new form, lifting his own empty body out to the surface and to his village. But when the humans took arms, it was Indy who wanted to unleash a terrible power and kill them all. But it was Azriel, with his compassion, who resisted. A plan to poison himself so Azrael could absorb his soul and retrieve human souls to break the barrier was aborted because Azrael couldn't go through with it, as you couldn't go through with killing anyone. Indy wanted power to kill humanity and reignite the war. But Frisk, why did he climb the mountain? Curiosity? Sadness? Anger? Loneliness? Or was it just a simple, childish mistake? Why did Frisk climb the mountain? Why did you play Undertale? Uh, see, buddy? I told you would be good, didn't I? Yeah, that was amazing. Thanks, Santa. But I still don't get what all this has to do with Christmas. What do you mean? Well, I guess some things represent Christmas in the game. Asgore playing Santa and delivering presents. Snowden was pretty Christmassy, but what else? Yeah, I guess. And all that pain and, and all that suffering. I mean, Christmas is supposed to be about coming together with the people you love. And it's supposed to be about food, isn't it? It's a, what about the food? I mean, there was food in the game. Uh, what about gifts? Was the, was the gift that we gave freedom to the monsters? Does that mean Frisk is Santa or? Look, dude. 
just relax, okay? You're thinking too much into it. Christmas isn't about gifts, or family, or food. It's simple. Simple, really, you bonehead. It is? Yeah, it is. It's about happiness. It's about joy. Are you not happy, man? Yeah, I... I guess. Well then, Merry Christmas! <laughs> Merry Christmas, Santa. But... What if I played the game again, but I killed everyone this time? Whoa, 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 settle down there. If you do that, trust me, you're going to have a bad time. I think you've had enough on the tough one night, don't you think? Hello fellow Bin Raiders, thank you so much for joining me for this Christmas special of Indie Bin. As you can tell, Undertale is near and dear to my heart, and I hope I've done the game justice. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like, tell me what you thought with a comment down below, and consider subscribing. I'd like to thank a good friend of mine, Sam O'Hara as my last minute actor. He did a brilliant job and brought the role of Santa to life. Furthermore, Smartydom, an insanely talented VFX artist and all-round editing wizard, helped with colour correction and designed the final shots, so please give him some love. Retro Arcade Monkey, Matthew Kellier and Katie Lou lent their vocal talents to the project, playing a narrator, Asriel and Alphys respectively. As with the others I've mentioned, you can find all of their channel links down in the description below, so please go and support them, they're all extremely talented individuals who brought these episodes to life. Music was graciously provided by Insane in the Rain Music and Video Game Remixes. Again, their links will be down below, check out their stuff. Both musicians have done wonders with the basic soundtrack, of course composed by the ever-talented Toby Fox. Once again, thank you so much for watching and supporting the show. For now, I'm going to enjoy the rest of my Christmas break. Merry Christmas, Bin Raiders, keep Bin Raiding, and I'll see you in the new year. Dark, 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 dark,
Cosmic Drive.